Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Reading from Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depths of the riches, and the wisdom, and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be paid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen.
hearts from them. Father, as we begin the season of Lent, we pray that you will impress upon our hearts how costly is our salvation. The price that the Lord Jesus paid on the cross to purchase our salvation. During this 40-day preparation for the celebration of Easter, Christ's resurrection from the dead, we pray that you will work in our hearts. Help us to examine our walk with you, to examine the small sins that we may be comfortable with, and to be willing to forsake those sins, to draw closer to you and to Jesus, and to be led by your Holy Spirit. We pray that this time of Lent will be a period in which we will grow in our obedience to you, to glorify you in all aspects of our lives, and to grow in our love and our admiration of you. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
a child of the King. Amen? Yes. We welcome you to our worship service here at Montgomery Hills Baptist Church. We're glad you're in the building. We're glad you're on Zoom. May God's presence fill us each one today as we worship Him with song, spoken word, through the message that Pastor Jerry is, will bring us. And in your own hearts as you sit there. You know, sometimes the Lord speaks to you and me at times when the subject is something completely else. He just kind of sends a message in and you go, oh, where did that come from? It's the Lord. So listen for him today. Just a few quick announcements. We have some beautiful flowers today. We're honoring Charlie Maine on his birthday this month. And also Alice Basford. You had a birthday, Alice? Oh my gosh. Happy birthday, Alice. Second one is, uh, we have two wonderful Lenten studies. I encourage you to be a part of one of these Lenten studies. It's pretty easy. You can join the Agape class on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. They're studying uh, 24 hours that change the world. How's it going, Giselle? It's a good study, isn't it? Good. So you're welcome to join. Women and men alike are invited to the Agape class to appreciate and learn from this study. And then Pastor Jerry is starting a study this Wednesday night called Embracing the Uncertain. It sounds like it's appropriate for our time. So join him on Zoom on Wednesday nights for Embracing the Uncertain. Don't forget that this is the last week for you to mail your ballots in. And don't wait till Saturday. Don't do a share on that. Don't go, don't drop it in the mailbox Saturday and go, dear Lord, please let that postman deliver it today. It doesn't work that way. So get it in the mail if you haven't sent it already. Uh, this, this is the last week. Sunday is a church conference. No, two weeks. When is it? The 20th. Okay. Be the 20th. So two weeks. Uh, I mean, the next week is the final day to get your ballot in. This week, final, final time to get your ballot in. Somebody else needs to do this, right? And then on March 20th, there'll be a church conference with additional um, business, and then we'll announce the results of the election. Correct? Oh, my goodness. That's why I'm not a lawyer. We're all heartbroken by the stories and pictures coming out of Ukraine, right? We want to do something to help. Well, there's an article in the bulletin on the back about how we can help with our money. Um, American Baptists are, uh, are very much involved in aiding the Ukrainians in their needs. One great hour of sharing, and uh, we're invited to participate in that. You can make your check payable to Montgomery Hills Baptist Church and then put on the memo line, one great hour of sharing, or O-G-H-S. Might be easier that way. And give. Okay. Okay. Um, that's it. I don't have any other announcements. There's some things coming up in the next couple of weeks. You can read about those and participate. All right. It's time for our offering. So, ushers, if you please come forward. Praise God, praise God. We are children of the King. Thank you, King Jesus, for your sacrifice to, for us, that we can belong to your family and call you brother, call you Savior, call you Lord. Bless this offering that we give. There's so many needs, Lord, across the world, in our community and, and in our church. So we pray, uh, we ask you to bless this and use it to meet those needs, and to bless others. In the name of Jesus, amen.
is not in what I own. I want you to learn the chorus first and then join me on the verses as you become more familiar with it. I rejoice. I rejoice in my Redeemer. Oh. 
The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 37 to 49. It's on page 838 in the Pew Bibles, if you wish to join us. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? The disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how could you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take the speck out in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. The one, that one, is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid a foundation on rock. And when the flood arose and the river burst against the house, it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, immediately it fell, and great was the ruin of that house. Here in the reading of the word. As I mentioned earlier, our hearts are broken about the scenes in Ukraine. So certainly that's a, a, a prayer that we all are praying for peace and uh, protection. And just that the world will stop. Stop before we get to a worse place. But especially to pray for the Ukraine. And also for the, the horrible explosion and building collapse in Silver Spring. So many families were um, affected by that, displaced. Um, and to, to date, I haven't heard that there was a, a fatality out of it. So there are several people in the hospital, and there's still uh, a couple of things, a couple of people that they're checking on. But to this time, I don't know of any, any deaths. Still, pray for those folks. And then in our own family, um, Angela told me this morning that her brother Ken, Ken has stage four cancer, uh, but he's in the hospital right now with AFib, and they have also discovered that one of his arteries is bleeding. So we need to pray, we want to pray for Ken and his family. Also, Sue King has knee replacement Tuesday, right? Yes. Tuesday. So let's pray for Sue for the surgery and also for recovery um, at this time. Are there any other prayer requests? We need to mention there's a whole list of them in the weekly email. I encourage you to look at that and use that in your prayer time. Other requests? During this season of Lent, one of the things that I want to do with this prayer time is begin with the, with the time of individual confession. Lent's about getting inside of ourselves and facing what it is that would keep us from fully experiencing the joy of what we know is at the end of this journey. And in order to do that, we have to work at it. It doesn't come to us naturally. We don't just easily enter into those places inside. So at the beginning of this morning prayer, 
pastor prayer each Sunday during the season, and then we're going to begin with a time of silence and ask you, each one, to look into your own heart, into your own spirit, and bring up and confess to God as a way of preparing for this season of, of, of Lent that we embark upon today. So we're going to begin with that this morning. Following that, there will be a blessing of assurance, prayer of assurance, followed by pastor prayers we're used to on Sunday morning. So I invite you, nobody else will do this for you. It's something you either do for yourself or it doesn't get done. So I invite you to take advantage of this moment to examine your own heart and your own spirit and confess anything there that you find to God in prayer. Let's pray together at this point in time. God knows us better than we know ourselves. We ask you during this season of Lent that you would help us to get in touch with the things that are barriers between us and your spirit within us. Hear us this morning as we have confessed those things that we've come to know and identify. Your word tells us that if we, if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And indeed, it has been our experience throughout our lives that when we, whenever we are honest and open with who we are, where we fall short, and confess those to you, that we do experience that forgiveness that flows over us like grace and gives us new light and new hope. And so this morning, we claim the assurance of that forgiveness as you have promised based upon our confession that has been offered up to you today. Lord, we live in a troubled world. We know that as troubled as we are about it, that it is an even burden to bigger burden to you because each participant, each one suffering, each one causing pain and grief is one of your children that you love. Lord, we pray today for those that are suffering, those who are homeless and sheltered and worried about family, worried about their children, those that are in harm's way, and we pray for those that are causing harm. We pray even for the Vladimir Putin's of this world, not because we want to, but because our Lord has told us we need to do that. I don't understand how that works, but I trust the word of my Lord when he says we need to pray for our enemies, and so I do. I pray for these whose names that we have mentioned here this morning that are facing trials and difficulties in their own lives, lives of friends and family members. They're struggling with, with so many things in their lives. What is Cumbersome as we feel all of these things are to us, as much of a burden, we are sure that they are even more so to you. And we join you now in whatever way we can. Lift up those cares and those burdens and share them with one another that we might in some small way help others to bear the burden that is theirs. Lord, we've come here from a 
a troubled world with noise and threats and problems on every hand. Still our spirits in this moment that we might hear your still quiet voice of your spirit speaking from within us and addressing each and every one of the needs that we have brought to this place. Your children now wait before you in anticipation and in expectation, asking only that you touch us, speak to us, and draw us deep into your love and into your grace. This now is our prayer. In that name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. This is just to remind you since we, since I skipped a Sunday last Sunday, and you didn't skip a Sunday, but I skipped a Sunday last Sunday, that this is the third and final message from Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a condensed version. It's not as, as long, it's not as complete, it's not as full, but it is covering the same kind of teaching that we God in Matthew, we know in Matthew 5 through 7. And I just want to remind you what, what happened in the first two sessions. Uh, in session one, verses 20 to 26, 26 uh, we got a shortened version of the Beatitudes, whereas Matthew offered 10, Luke offers 4. And they were blessed are the poor. But theirs is the kingdom of God. And what we see here, same as in Matthew, what we see here is the great reversal taking place. The kingdom comes and turns everything upside down. Those that are accursed in this life are blessed in the kingdom. So blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are hungry now, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who weep, who mourn, for they will laugh when everything gets turned upside down. And blessed are you who are hated, excluded, reviled, and defamed for Jesus' sake. Great. In the second week, the week after that, we got to what I call the heart of the battle which is the core of what Jesus was trying to teach. The heart of the matter, what, what kingdom life is like. How we are being drawn into live our lives. And this was the tough one. Remember? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. None of that stuff comes easy. None of that stuff comes natural. It's a struggle. It's hard for any one of us to do those things. So, summed up then to do to others as you would have them do to you, be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. That's Jesus' picture of what is like, life in the kingdom. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to behave. And there's nothing whatsoever to do with what anybody else does. We don't love our enemies only if they love us back. We love them anyway. That's what Jesus was saying to us. And now we come to the concluding section of, of Luke's account of this Sermon on the Mount. And in this concluding section, he adds a couple more things. Verses 37 and 38, he says, do not judge, do not condemn. You don't have enough information, enough knowledge, enough wisdom, enough spiritual insight to be able to judge anyone else. Period. 
There's only one person who knows it not to be the judge. And all I can say is not me, and it's not you. So don't judge. Don't condemn other people. But instead, verses 37 and 38, instead of judging and condemning, forgive them. Instead of judging and condemning, forgive them. Now, this is the, the, the title of the message is, Why Do You? And Jesus, there's two why do you questions in this text this morning. This is the first one. Um, and it's a familiar parable. Um, Jesus tells the parable, can a blind person guide a blind person? Would I both fall into a pit? So he asked the question, um, why do you, this is verse 41, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't see that big log sticking out of your own eye? Why do you do that? Every one of us does. One of the things that constantly, constantly aware of is when something in somebody else, if I see something in other people, consistently bothers me, offends me, I don't like it, I have learned that I better take a step back and ask myself a question. Do I see that and respond the way it did to them because I deal with that myself? And it's surprising. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it is surprising. How often did that the answer to that question is, Yes. You see and are troubled by those things that someone else because you struggle with it yourself. Now, if I was a psychologist or psychiatrist, I would call that projection. Jesus called it. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye when you can't see that big old log sticking out of your eye? The question, Jesus, why do we do that? Well, we do. Then a reminder in verses 43 to 45 that what all of this is about is not judging, that seeing this speck instead of in somebody else, instead of the wall in here. All of this is about a reflection of what you are in yourself. It's not the behavior itself that's the problem, that hurts, and it's painful. It hurts you and it hurts other people as well. <clears throat> but the problem is that that kind of behavior reflects the reality in your body and in your spirit. Because Jesus said that a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. So if you find a tree full of bad fruit, don't blame the fruit. It's a problem with the tree. And if you find a follower of Jesus that doesn't reflect these things, don't blame the behavior. Most importantly, if you see in yourself, feel in yourself, a lack of these things that Jesus says what this should be all about, it's time to open side. It's time to take a season like Lent to, to inspect yourself. Ask God to show you. This is a dangerous prayer, by the way. I've learned this. A very dangerous prayer to ask God to show you these things in your life. That you're stumbling blocks to you coming. That you found your follower Jesus as you are today. But God will answer that prayer. And you will see things and experience things and become aware of things that you haven't been before. That ought to be our prayer during the season of the It should be. Open it up, open me up and let me see what it is that I might confess, it, that I might make it up. You know, those moments, every once in a while, that's not every once in a while, it's quite often actually, but a celebrity, a politician, an athlete, a preacher, 
someone has caught with a live mic or video that they didn't know was going on, and acting in ways that is, is a complete opposite of the image they try to paint for, for us and for everybody else, and probably try to paint for themselves too. But what happens when that recording from the live mic or the video from whoever took it becomes public, then they have to give an explanation for what was going on. And it's almost always the same, one way or another. It's always, well, that's not the real me. You know, I just, I didn't know the one. I didn't know it was live. What I said wasn't for a public consumption, it was just what you guys want. That, that somehow that's not really who I am. I was angry, or I was drunk, or I was tired, or I was just caught off guard, or I was just kidding. It was a joke. Don't you get a joke? And when I hear that, because I'm aware of how I do things, when I hear them say that, what I hear them say is, you caught me at a time when my folders were down. When, when the things that I put up to protect that stuff from getting out, I just never got out. Because I think the most realistic picture of who we are is who we are in those ungodly moments. When we're not consciously trying to project an image or to be a certain. I think those are the moments we all ought to pay more attention to. Because those moments are the ones that we have to overcome and fight and be aware of. And I think that's exactly what Jesus was saying in this particular part of, of the message here about the tree and the fruit. Problem is inside. It's in the roots of that tree or in the trunk of that tree. It's in our hearts. It's in our spirits. What we see outside of us is only a reflection of what's there. We need to take advantage of opportunities to face that and do something about it. Now, everything in this sermon up to this point, in Jesus' sermon up to this point, has led him to the point of a conclusion. And his conclusion is this, that anyone serious about being a follower, now Matthew's gospel did toward just before this, Jesus has said, this is not an easy thing I'm asking you to do. He has said, he has said the gate is narrow and the road is tough. Follow this road that leads to life and truth and hope and joy and everything that we want out of life. Not many will follow. Because the other gate's wide open. Anybody can stumble there, stumble into there. And it's an easy coast because that's where everybody's going. You get plenty of reinforcement from the company you keep on that. Make no mistake about it, what Jesus is calling us to do and to be is tough. It is hard and difficult. He's very aware of that difficulty. And he knows that because he himself was modeling it for his disciples, for his followers. He knows that because he knew what lay at the end of this journey that he has now begun with them, that we've begun with them. Leads eventually to Calvary. He knew he was challenging them because he was himself being challenged. It was going to cost him his life. You and I should not expect it to be easy for us. And here it is. This is verse 26. Jerry Young is not saying this to you. Jesus is. Verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? 
not do what I tell you. I think we ought to each sit for about 30 minutes with that question. Everyone in our brain and our schools. Why do you call me Lord and Lord? And then don't do what I told you to do. Why do you do that? Well, I have to say with Paul, I don't know. The things I want to do are the things I don't do. The things I don't want to do are the things I find myself doing anyway. I don't know why I do that. And that's the time for us to be able to learn some of that. If, if we we'll look at it and face it, Think about it. But Jesus says, here's what it's like. This is what this means. I'll show you what someone is like who actually comes to me. Here's my words and acts on them. A man was building a house, and we were all a dwelling place for our spirits and for our hopes and for our lives. Man is building a house. No, that's an ongoing thing. The man didn't have to finish building the house. You will not finish building your house either. It's an ongoing process, an ongoing work. And in doing so, he intentionally seeks out the dead. That's harder to do that. You've got to dig down sometimes to find that dead body. So it costs more money, it takes more time, it's a lot more effort. It's more So he digs down and finds, finds the dead body and he lays the foundation of the house to go. Then he goes out. And then when the floods rose, not if the floods came, but when it happened. Floods do come. The fires do come. The storms do come. The tests do come. The wars do come. The hurricanes do come. Life does come and roll over us. Not a question of it. The question is when it happens. What kind of foundation is it built on? Jesus is saying the foundation he's laying down. Hear my words and do them. And that foundation and only that foundation. Long enough to stand against what's going to happen in all of our lives and in all kinds of different ways. So, what do you trust in this morning for the foundation of your life? Because you're doing it. I mean, honestly. Not what you say in Sunday school class when we get talking about these kinds of things. But in the darkness, in the dark of night, in the winter in despair, what kind of foundation are you trying to build your life upon? Again, why do you say Lord, Lord? And did not intentionally work to build your life, your dwelling place, with the actions that Jesus has told us and shown you are reflective both of his own life and of life in the kingdom. The true father of Jesus comes to him, hears his word, and acts on it. Those are the fruits produced by the good heart that has been touched by Jesus has clearly heard his words and is committed to making those teachings the foundation of his life. Why, oh why, do you call me Lord? Don't do what he says. This first Sunday morning in the I would challenge each of you, as I challenge myself, not to worry about giving up some, some comfortable life to live. 
I found that not difficult to do. Every year I choose to give up broccoli. No problem with that. I don't eat broccoli anyway, but it sounds good that I'm going to give up my broccoli. That's the kind of thing we usually do. I would challenge you instead to plunge deep into your own spirit and identify the things in your heart that are keeping you from producing life that Jesus has called you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all came up to the end of this journey and we're already being rejuvenated because we stood in the presence of Christ and said, take this and mold it and make it into what you want it to be. And it intentionally set out to live the way he has called us to live. Leave you with a question on the morning tonight. Why do you not? Why do you call Jesus Lord and not do the things that he tells you to do? You don't have to answer that question today. But you do have to answer Jesus. Right? I don't know what it would take for you this morning to put you on the path. But I have absolutely no doubt that if you were to open your spirit today to the presence of the love and the grace of God in your life, God would make it clear to you what you need to do. And then the only option is what you want to do. After you hear, it comes a time of decision. What do I do? That's the question of this moment. We never, we never, never hear God's word without there being some decision to follow our problems. Affirm, give thanks to someone. It's never just an exercise. Somebody says the words will be secure. Never. That's the question today. Is the question of Jesus. Why do you call me Lord? Don't do what I tell you to do. This is God's clear speaking. If we stand there, this is not the only response. Jesus, keep me near the cross. In 385, we'll sing the first, third, and fourth Jesus.
one of the things that we have to help with. What we just thought about that yeah. actually they have found Christ developing ourselves in the university lifestyle. Man. One of the things that we have to help with is this is it's the coming together of God's people and the table that represents that we follow and the price that he paid the spirit of his own self of us. A broken body has been shown on us. Reminding us of what has been done for us. Grace is God's evidence by the fact that the invitation to move to the banquet is for any of you to To share in the gift of God's grace. That's the gift of God. And one thing that we ought to be sure of in this and other things that we do is one who calls us to acknowledge in this world. Is also one who loves us in a way that we cannot possibly comprehend. We have this terrible fear that somehow if we make this kind of commitment and surrender, we were going to be asking terrible, horrible things that we were made to do. And in fact, the gift of love, love to buy love, to share that love. It is in the name of that Jesus Christ that we're invited to death in this time. Not at my table, but when they go back to the church to pay for it. It's the Lord's table. Jesus will invite me. Love and grace and flow in this to each one of us as we come. Would you join me, please? Gracious God, we cannot possibly comprehend the love for us and the grace that is offered to us in so many ways. Bring us now to this table. Bring us to a place where we sit with the risen Christ, with our brothers and sisters. We partake of that which reminds us of our Lord who loved us and who gave himself for us and who modeled for us when we want to put our lives in the kingdom. May this time bless us and may we be a blessing. In the name of Christ our Lord.
time and celebrated the Passover meal, which was that celebration, that great redemptive celebration of the Old Testament. There as they sat around the table, Jesus reached over and he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he told him, said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Apostle Paul later write, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Same way, saying this comes to the cover. Do this as often as you eat. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do proclaim the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that God had the first experience in this summer. That the disciples sang a hymn to God. The same way, let you stand together and sing the part of Him. Let's be the time. Thank you. 